Good afternoon, everyone. So glad that you could all come out on this wintry day. Thank goodness it's, there's no snow and ice for us. <laughs> we can take a little cold, just not the wet stuff with it. Um, before we get started, I'm sure all of you know, I'm Anna Ruxlow. I'm the alumni director at McPherson College. And it's my privilege today to announce your speaker for today. It is my privilege to present J.D. Bowman, Associate Professor of Theater. He received his bachelor's from McPherson College in 1998, his master's of fine arts, sorry, <laughs> from Kent State University. He and his wife Becky have worked with McFer at McPherson College since 2006. And I asked one of J.D.'s students for a good description of him as a professor. Uh-oh. And now he's worried. <laughs> <laughs> the student said, Professor Bowman encourages students to expand the limits of their thinking, to look at life beyond just black and white, and to remember that everything means something. What a great teacher. <laughs> I'm going to keep that quote. That's a good quote. I like that one. <laughs> so today, Professor Bowman will be sharing with us the pageantry of theater and religion. JD. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see you all today. Um, I have to get it out right away and let you know how nervous I am to be speaking in front of you. A lot of people think that because I am an actor that I don't get nervous when I speak in front of people. But see, these words I had to write. And usually as an actor, I get to say someone else's words and be somebody else. And it's not really as nerve wracking. But uh, it's good to see so many of you here and so many friendly faces. So thank you for having me. And uh, thanks, Anna. That's a really neat quote. I'm going to keep that. that. I don't, I don't get nice quotes often? No, I do. <laughs> um, actually, today I am going to be talking about um, a way of looking at theater and religion. Um, uh, theater and, I guess, organized religion or church, kind of putting church in quotes, have always kind of been, um, I don't know why, but recently, I guess, they're related as like kind of the Hatfields and the McCoys. I mean, they're like not supposed to be hanging out together. They're, uh, they're kissing cousins, perhaps, that shouldn't be uh, put in the same room. And I, I, I actually think that when they, when they get media attention, they're usually both, both fields are flaunting their extreme, um, their extreme differences rather than all of their similarities. Uh, in reality, though, they have more in common. They're more like Cain and Abel, I guess, would be a better, <laughs> a better way to, to put them, which might not be a good comparison at first when you think about the um, relationship that uh, Cain and Abel had at the end of their relationship, but they're brothers. They're, they're, they're still loving brothers at the beginning of their relationship. Um, so just to let you know that when I'm talking about today... Um, when I'm talking about theater and religion or church, well, I'm going to be talking specifically about Western traditional theater um, coming out of the Greek tradition. And I'll also be talking primarily about Christianity. I mean, there's many, many parallels to other branches of religions, but um, in order to be more concise and not ramble on, as I tend to do, I uh, am going to pick Christianity today. <coughs> theater is a Greek word. Many of you probably already know this. This is why I'm nervous, because I'm talking to such a well-educated crowd. <laughs> uh, but theater is the Greek word referring to a broader culture of events and activities that took place uh, during Dionysia. That would be the big festival of the Greeks. It was a large festival honoring the god Dionysus, and it was the second most important festival for the Greeks. The main festival that was the most important was uh, what ended up becoming the Olympics, um, which we still also uh, celebrate from the Greeks. So. Um, Dionysius, uh, for those of you that don't remember, and yes, none of you were here then, so um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'll be here all week. Um, for those of you that don't remember, that he was the god of grape harvest and wine, the god of ritual mad madness and of ecstasy. I have a, a uh, oops, I have a picture of him here, strapping young lad with a toga, and uh, you can't quite see it too well, but he has grapes all around him. Um, and I, my students like to remember him as the god of wine, but that is not actually why theater is connected with 
uh, Dionysus. Um, he's actually, it's more because of the god of ritual madness. Um, he was known as a liberator in the Greeks because the wine and music and dance would free his followers from their self-conscious fear and care, and it would subvert the oppressive restraints of the powerful. But theater is this idea of ritual madness and ecstasy. If, uh, if you're not making that leap with me, um, ask any gentleman who works on Broadway and does eight shows uh, a week what it's like to stand up and wear someone else's clothes and speak someone else's words and wear makeup for half the week, and then we can talk about ritual madness. <laughs> they do that every week, um, and uh, uh, they're getting paid to do that. <coughs> so modern theater itself comes originally from this religious experience. It is a religious experience, and um, that's understandable. Theater and organized religion originally were together in the same celebration. It's not difficult, really, to look at the two as still having those similarities. Performances in Greek times were split into three categories, uh, primarily, and this is kind of a Cliff Notes version. They have the comedies and the tragedies and the satire, uh, which we'll get to that in a second. Um, tragedy is, um, I, I talk to my students about how tragedy is um, focusing on celebrating the positive qualities and characteristics of our society. A lot of students get um, hung up on this. Why are tragedies positive? Well, if you think about Hamlet and what Hamlet must do, even though he knows that it will not come to a good end, um, or I use Romeo and Juliet for my students. I talk about Romeo and Juliet and how love is this wonderful quality of humanity, and they must risk everything because they are in love, even though they end up dying in the end. So they're still showing that it's tragic because it's showing a positive trait. They're still going to pick the positive trait and the good in their situation, even though they will die out of that situation. So <coughs> that's tragedy. Um, oh, spoiler alert, I probably should have said, Romeo and Juliet die if you haven't read that. Sorry. <laughs> Guessing you might be familiar with it. Uh, but we as an audience, we feel sad when someone good and honorable chooses the right thing um, and they don't have success. They, they still have to have some sort of tragic ending. So comedy then, if tragedy shows the positive traits, comedy shows the negative traits in our society. And that's actually why we laugh, because we know that it's wrong. And we laugh about all the things that they're doing that are wrong in our in our lexicon. Um, the idea that um, uh, uh, in the last show I, I played a character who was trying to um, hide his uh, love child that he had in an extramarital affair, hide that away from his wife at the same time he was trying to cheat his company out of some money and uh, let's see, he was drinking a whole bunch um, and all of the things that, that my character was doing were funny because they were negative qualities. No one ever looked at that show, or at least I hope, I don't think so. I know none of my students looked at that show and looked at the character that I played and thought, oh, I want to be that person when I grow up. Because <laughs> they know that it's a negative quality. There's another uh, uh, simple example, uh, a Jim Carrey movie not too long ago uh, called Liar Liar. And the comic, um, the comic story in that movie is a son wishing that his father can't tell a lie for 24 hours. And the jokes happen for the next 24 hours when this notorious liar of a father, who happened to also be a lawyer at the time, because that's you know, stereotypically funny to say that lawyers can't lie, um, and he couldn't tell a lie for 24 hours. So in the courtroom and uh, uh, in, the, in his school's parent-teacher conference and all of these different situations, you find the audience laughing at situations where he wants to lie, and you can tell that he wants to lie. And probably my favorite is when his wife tries on a new outfit made out of like spandex or something, and she says, does this outfit make me look fat? And you just see this look on his face like, uh, uh, <laughs> where's the exit? Where do I go? What do I do? Because um, he knows he doesn't want to, uh, he, he has to learn how to tell the truth in a polite way instead of just lying his way out of it. Um, most of the Hollywood films that are um, 
focused on negative traits, try to have some sort of positive ending at the end of them. So in Liar Liar, uh, he, ha he learned a lesson from it. He learned this moral lesson from it, what it was like. Oh, he was ruining a lot of people's lives by lying, and it was bad, and he'll try not to lie ever again, and the, the, the wish has, has worn off, and he, does, he is not compelled to tell the truth any longer, um, but he will tell the truth because he chooses to do so, and it's all wonderful, and there's rainbows and puppy dogs and lollipops at the end, and it's wonderful. Um, but for the most point, comedy is showing us those negative traits. I had some people try to argue that uh, Romeo and Juliet could be seen as a comedy because it's these two adolescents that are just saying, if I can't get what I want, I'll just die, <laughs> which they do. Um, but I think really what you want to focus on is what is the intention in the plot of the author. And in Romeo and Juliet, it's love, which is one of our greatest qualities in society. So um, it would be still considered a tragedy. The third category being satire uh, really um, is what has grown into rhetoric, um, news media, politics, politicking. Uh, so we don't, I don't actually touch on that too much in my class. There's um, a great a uh, series of classes that Dr. Bowman teaches at the college that deals a lot more with that. And so I um, encourage students to go that direction and find out more about rhetoric that way. So with comedy and tragedy, we're looking at these two categories that focus on the positive and the negative traits in our society. Now, my father's a minister. My uncle's a minister. My brother's a minister. My grandfather's a minister. And I've been to church a couple times. <laughs> and when I go to church, it seems like church also focuses on the positive and the negative qualities of our society. Sometimes to comic events, I've been to services that are quite comic. And sadly, I've been to services that are pretty tragic. <laughs> but for the most part, what I'm focused on when I'm at that service is how our human society are interacting with um, our religion, whatever denomination that is within Christianity. So um, before we get into more parallels between the two, I want you to think about um, your religion with, uh, your, your experience with religion, with organized religion. And I'd like to kind of just break up, well, just by table, really. And I want you to, to tell the story to someone at your table about an experience you had at church that um, was, well, um, an odd experience, something that you did at a church service that you thought just was really an odd feeling. Why are we doing this? What does this have to do with anything? How, how am I getting anything out of this? Or do you remember something or visiting a church that you weren't familiar with and a ritual that they did during a service that you didn't understand? So maybe off the top of your head, it'll be hard to think of one, but hopefully with, uh, while going around the table, you'll be able to come up with a couple from the table. So let's take just a couple minutes to do that now. I'll have you guys uh, talk amongst yourselves, and I'll help you out. <laughs> Okay, let's start to wrap up those discussions. Sorry to interrupt. <coughs> um, I'll tell you one of my stories, and then I'll see what table you want to, if you want to share one of your stories from your table, maybe that would be great as well. Uh, I, I grew up, um, actually, Anne and I were talking about this because uh, both of our experiences were going to a Catholic church at the first, for the first time and, and experiencing Mass. And um, for my experience, I grew up in the Church of the Brethren, which um, during communion was kind of an alcohol-free church. And uh, the first Catholic church I went to, um, I didn't realize that you weren't supposed to take communion if you weren't actually a member there, if you weren't actually Catholic. And so I thought I knew what I was doing, and I just got in line with everyone else and went over. And when I got to the cup, just took a big old swig of grape juice and spit it all out right <laughs> over the person who was handing it out. Um, and it was a little odd experience for me. It was a different ritual that I wasn't, I wasn't ready for. That was kind of um, confusing. Uh, who else has an example from a table? And Anna has a, a microphone, too, so we can make sure everyone can be heard. Who else has an example from their table that was a good example of uh, an odd 
uh, or, or uncomfortable experience that you had the first time experiencing a ritual at the church? Oh, here, yes. This wasn't uncomfortable for me, but when we first went out to teach, we were, Dayton was teaching near his home church at Bethel Church in Nebraska. And uh, there was a, a, well, he was old enough to have made his choice to be baptized. His name was Freddie Bean Blossom. And uh, they got him down in the water to baptize him, and all of a sudden he jumped out of the baptismal pool and tore out of the church. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I suppose they considered him baptized. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, my experience was in a Catholic church also <laughs> up in northern Minnesota and it was a very small church and uh, we all filed I went with a group of nuns <laughs> and they all knew what to do but we were all sitting there and all of a sudden the man next to me turned and kissed me on the cheek and then I realized that everybody was kissing everybody, and I was supposed to pass it on. So that was a very, I think they called it the kiss of peace or something. That they were passing, but yeah. Kind of exciting to a little Baptist from Texas, you know. <laughs> yes. Good. Anyone else want to share a story? Um, he probably remembers better than I do, but uh, we were on our honeymoon trip uh, down south and went to a Methodist church one Sunday. And uh, the Methodist minister had been to, um, I guess, a national, probably, meeting like we have in our church. And they were discussing uh, letting blacks into the church. And he made it very well known uh, that their church was not for it, he was not for it, and their church was not going to allow it. And I got very uncomfortable in the church. If you don't know the, yeah, the church body that you're sitting among, then you're like, am I... They were so nice to us. Right, right, uh, yeah. But I guess we were what they considered the right color. So. <laughs> right. We were visiting in Florida at a Methodist church on Communion Sunday, and lo and behold, it wasn't purple in the cup, it was kind of white. And we thought, this is kind of different not to have grape juice. And it was explained, it's apple juice, and because there's so many old people here, in case the grape juice spills on you, <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> So that was that was a good idea. Oh, that's a, yeah, huh? <laughs> it does stain. Yeah. <laughs> it's polite. A little polite communion. Since we've been talking so much about wine. Um, <laughs> I, I I directed choir at the Lutheran Church when I first came back to teach, and um, they allowed me to uh, take some. I had some college students quite frequently that would come down and help us with our choir and special music. And they had communion every Sunday, I think, with real wine. Plus, they also had these wafers. And so I soon learned that if you let that wafer get on the roof of your mouth, you've got all, all service to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, plus, plus a lot of these kids that I had go down were brethren, and they hadn't grown up with real wine either. So I always warned them. I said, now, if you want to do communion, I just want to warn you, it's real wine. And I told them what to do with their wafer. Keep it away from the roof of your mouth. <laughs> Get that thing so, taken care of before you take the wine part. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, I, I, um, anyone else want to share a story? I have a story to share? I, I've, been, I've been in a church service um, at a home church when I lived in Wichita. My, my uh, partner and I were visiting church. I mean, well, we were members there, actually. And, uh, it was a summer Sunday, which is sometimes a very different type of thing if you're a minister, you understand that. And uh, it, they had decided to do some, for lack of a better term, some chanting. Um, and they had some uh, dry ice over the altar, and it was kind of bubbling and boiling and coming down the altar and the steps up near the sanctuary. And I thought, wow, if I was a visitor here today, I would wonder what type of church this is. I just thought about you know, the, the different rituals that people do. And, um, 
and, and what some people become more comfortable with because they know who they're sitting around, uh, other people might find as a, a, a different experience, even uncomfortable experience. I, I, I can't imagine passing a kiss around the, uh, around the uh, auditorium, although we should try that at theater sometime and say, welcome, let's pass the kiss of peace. Um, that might be kind of fun. There are rituals in theater as well, um, many of them, for instance, uh, I don't personally believe this one, but one of the superstitions is you're not allowed to say the, the title of the Shakespeare Scottish play in the theater. You can't say Macbeth. And if you do, you have to um, go outside the theater. You have to back up outside the theater and turn around three times counterclockwise and then spit, and then you'll be allowed back into the theater. I could tell you a big story about where that comes from, but that's just one of those crazy rituals. And if you were visiting uh, in a cast that was performing Shakespeare and you happened to mention Macbeth, everyone in the room would be like, oh! <laughs> they would stare at you like you just said. You just brought in the plague. They would be really surprised why you did that. Um, it, at our theater, where I'm working, that we, we do a lot of uh, warm-ups, uh, vocal warm-ups. Um, we do things to help with enunciation. We do some tongue twisters. Uh, sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. Um, but you could go downstairs before a show and hear some people um, just kind of chanting to themselves, good blood, bad blood, good blood, bad blood. Not something you want to just, you know, discover people muttering to themselves. Uh, uh, the other one's not so bad when they say red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. Um, but really, there's a lot of different types of rituals. And focusing on the church again, I, I, I want to talk about um, some of the biggest rituals that I've seen in church would be uh, weddings and weddings and funerals. This one, um, if you look at the most famous wedding from this last year, arguably, I guess, um, this would be... Um, Prince William and Kate in England and their lavish wedding that wasn't, I would probably argue, wasn't really for themselves. It really wasn't a private wedding that they were, um, you know, it was just with a couple million of their closest friends <laughs> on television. Um, I laugh, I pull this picture because these are the children that were part of the wedding party um, of which neither the bride nor groom knew very well. They were just assigned to be in the wedding party as part of the, part of the party. And uh, funerals as well have a certain amount of pageantry with them. This is the funeral of uh, Michael Jackson, who died a couple years ago. Uh, he actually had three funerals. Um, he had this one at the Staples Center in LA, the arena uh, Staples Center in LA, which was full. And then he had a private service for a few hundred people, and then he had a family service, a third service. And I think that's a really interesting thing to put both weddings and funerals in that category. Um, and let me, as a sidebar here, I do that because um, I, I don't think either of those events are for the person that's at the, at the center of attention. Um, obviously, the person uh, in the funeral is, is out of the, <laughs> they're, not, they're not planning the service, at least, let's say that. They're not actually, I don't know that Michael Jackson actually requested the Staples Center ahead of time. Um, and, and for a, a wedding as well, uh, the, the cliche is that the bride doesn't always plan that wedding, the bride and groom don't plan that wedding, that sometimes there are other people involved that help plan that as well. So um, it's actually, they are events that have become um, driven by the audience that goes to those events just as much as the people involved. And in theater, it's a similar experience. The audience, a lot of the time, drives the type of productions that are, in, uh, that are on stage. There was a, a rather crass um, uh, musical about 10 years ago called Avenue Q, and it had puppets in it that curse a lot. And um, it was supposed to be just a small production off-Broadway in a theater that only sat about 100 people. Well, they were sold out for months at a time, and so they moved to Broadway and they did very well and they won a whole bunch of awards because people hadn't seen musicals with puppets that curse in there before. Um, and because of that success, they have musicals like The Book of Mormon, which is even more crass um, and uh, comic and pointing out the negative traits in our society. And um, 
it, it's driven not just by the content. Someone doesn't sit around and say, you know, um, let's write a musical that has a whole bunch of cursing in it. They actually say, oh, look, that musical was sustained on Broadway and, it, and is making a lot of money. Let's write another musical about that. Um, it's not the type of people, it's not like that there's a certain uh, brand of people that just do that. Um, it's, it's actually a, a, a job. You know, the person that wrote the music for Avenue Q and for the Book of Mormon, that are both kind of blue as a, a style, uh, also wrote the music for Disney's Frozen, that's in the movie theaters right now, and Disney's uh, Winnie the Pooh movie that was two years ago. So it's not, it's not like a type of person is sitting there and saying, oh, this is what I can do. They're actually being driven by the market and what's being asked of them. Uh, sometimes that happens in church as well, although that was a little... A little more of a gray area. I decided not to go, <laughs> not to go down that, that road right now. <laughs> Next up, I have some of the costume pieces for some church services. So the, the specific seasons of, uh, of the church, the calendar of the church, kind of dictates some of the costumes of the church. This one's actually quite elaborate. Um, uh, you can't quite see it, but both at the top and the bottom are the, the gold stitching that's with it. Um, very pretty, actually. So we have people that stand up, talk about the positive and negative traits in our society. They wear a certain costume. They follow a certain script. Here's the women's head coverings by different religions. Right. You have in the top left, you have the Amish covering and how that differs from the Mennonite covering right here in the second row. It's a little darker picture, sorry about that. And then down at the bottom, the Orthodox Jewish Muslim coverings as well. And then you have another category and that's the actual location where you're gathering. Hey, here's a picture of the Drury Lane Theater in London that was built um, in the late 1600s. This would be um, renovated and, and kept up. Uh, it's our, I would say it's a nice um, version of a classic theater in the last 100 years. This would be a classic church as well. A lot of similarities in the way that we're sitting as an audience, what we're focused on, I liked this next two pictures. This was a, more of a modern theater, a black box theater. <clears throat> and this is a modern church built in Texas three years ago. Very much of, a, of an auditorium style um, of a, of a, of in setting. So what we're looking at when we're talking about some of those similarities between um, church and theater it is not to, to diminish the importance of either because they both can speak to our society in different ways but to notice that there are things that the church might be able to to learn from the theater and things that theater can definitely learn from church because neither one of those um, are about the building it doesn't matter the church that you go into. You can still worship wherever you are, right? It takes the people to make it happen. Theater is kind of the same way, too. You don't have to go to the same theater building. It actually takes the people to make a theatrical event wherever that is. So at the heart of it, you're looking at something that is going to speak to an audience. It's going to help sometimes hurt an audience. And you're hoping that the audience is what's going to continue to drive both of those experiences. When I go to church, I hear a message and I am uh, impacted on that message and maybe a new perspective of reading a scripture or uh, a new idea comes from that sermon that leads me down a whole different path of thought. And it lets me start to process things and, and ideas and grow that way spiritually. When I go to theater, 
I hear one little thought that sometimes will allow me to just go away from whatever I'm watching and go down another path and think about what that means to me. I process something a new way. I, I can watch Shakespeare over and over and over again and see it a different way each time. Well, actually, any show I can do that with. Uh, when we run a show like we did uh, last month, we did the musical Into the Woods, and we performed just the first act of that play for all of the elementary schools in town, and every show was different for me to watch. I could see different things each day that I watched that performance. Maybe it was because one of the students wasn't as tired that day, and so they enunciated better. Um, maybe it was because the students, uh, the, the elementary school students laughed so much at one line that I missed the next three lines, and I missed part of whatever was happening in that scene. But the production was different, and I was able to focus on things differently. That happens for me in church more often than I like to admit, because I have three small children, and sometimes I miss things, and sometimes I catch them. Sometimes I catch them too late, and I think, why are we, pray why are we praying about elephants? What are we doing? <laughs> What's going on? Oh, no, okay, no, you're drawing about elephants. We're praying about something else. I need to be more focused, <laughs> right? Um, it's about my environment. It's about the commitment of, of me as an audience member and what I bring to that experience. Uh, we've I like to think of uh, a, that we're moving away from the belief that someone that stands up in the beginning, in the front of the room, someone that stands up at the pulpit, someone that stands up on stage is just going to feed us information and we just take that information. I like to get away from that because I don't believe in that structure that, uh, that someone has that power to do that. Probably because I grew up in a family of ministers, and they wanted to help empower the people that came to their sermons. They didn't want to just say, this is how you have to be. Let me wag my finger at you. And the same, same thing. I don't want to get too preachy to my students when I stand up and I lecture, because it's not about that. It's about helping the knowledge come out of them. And there's a lot more similarities th between theater and religion that uh, I could spend more time talking about, but instead I wanted to show you a, a, a quick clip, if it'll work. Um, uh, this is a series, um, this is actually a church. This is a church, and they work through different parts of the gospel every week. And I wanted to show you what their service is like, um, and, and then we can talk about that a little bit. The Passover. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we're only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or oh, the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table at the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly, leave her alone. Said Jesus, why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. Thank you. So uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, about... I know that where I go to church, I don't know that this would be something that we'd be set up to do each week. Um, I suppose I could, I could ask the Whitakers if they could uh, start, start performing this way. Um, but it's a bit... I, I think that's very interesting. And he has, he has different gospels, uh, di different sections of the gospel are online. You can watch them. And he does. He, he varies his stance. And I believe it, he does it as part of the storytelling method and to uh, give people something different to look at. I, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable watching my pastor lay down on the job like that. <laughs> but he was. he was. He was trying to play a different character. And sometimes that can be very engaging and very interactive. That can be very interesting. Um, that is not the way our current society teaches either theater or religion. They keep those separate. Um, they te I was taught very clearly that when I am an actor, it is not, I can take parts of myself and put it into my character, but it is not me, 
My character is not me. So I personally have a really hard time performing in church dramas because I go to church and I want my personal relationship with God to be the center, to be my focus when I go to church. I want it to be my relationship with God. Well, how can I have that relationship with God if I'm pretending to be something I'm not? And I'd like to come to God myself. And so when I see something like this, it makes me, I'm intrigued. I'm like, well, that's a really interesting way to tell the story. But yet I'm uncomfortable because I, I, you know, is this the same minister that then goes for house visits? And, you know, who's going to end up ringing the doorbell when they come to visit? You know, who is he this time? it's It's a tricky, tricky situation. But it doesn't need to be. And I think I have had a lot, I have, I have gone to different churches and had a, a witnessed a lot of theatrical experiences at church. And I personally have had a lot of religious experiences at theater where something, usually something that I don't expect, that's usually when I have it <laughs> all the time. Usually I, I have the... Um, I have that moment where I'm, in a, I'm in watching a show that I completely think does not have anything to do with religion, and there's one line that comes out at me, and I think, oh, wow. I, I, I tell my students, and I'll say this here, I, Book of Mormon is a wonderful musical that is horribly offensive. It's absolutely terribly offensive. Um, I, I would never take my children to see that for years and years and years, I, not even until they... Even if they make the markers of certain age ratings that we have in our movies, I still would say, no, you're not going to see this. And, um, and I went and saw this musical because it had been selling out so much. And in the second act, there is a man that stands up and sings a song about belief and why he believes what he does. And I, I was in tears at the end of that song because it spoke to me on a spiritual level about my own religion. Why do I believe what I believe? And that's in the middle of all these scenes and songs with language that I was just, I was just floored by. I, I was like, this is not a musical about religion, and yet here I am being, being washed over ab- about spirituality. And I think that's, that's where it can happen. That is where both... Uh, that, is, that is the beauty of both of them together. The theatrical moments that awaken us in church and the religious and spiritual moments that awaken us in theater, that's the connection between the two. There's so many connections that we take, uh, we take for granted, like the costuming, the setting, sometimes the lighting. Uh, and yet, uh, if, if how many of you have been to a Christmas Eve candle lighting service? It's very theatrical, but it really speaks to a lot of us, right? So they both have their way. They both have their way of reaching us, but it it relies on the audience, what you bring to it to get out of it, and it relies on traits from each other to keep pushing it. And that's really because they're from the same place. They're from the same big festival about... Ritual madness, (laughs) which I remind my brother right before he preaches a sermon. (laughs) Ritual madness, go out there, go for it. Anyway, this is what I usually like to talk to my students about. I am glad that I got the opportunity to talk to you about that today as well. Thank you so much, and it was so good to see all of you today. I will stick around if you have extra questions or things that you want to talk about afterwards as well. Oh, and there already is. is in the sermon. What do you do about that? When the devil is in the sermon. Well, the devil's always in the details. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I've always heard. Uh, I, you know, and I think that's, I think that with, um, I experienced that with Book of Mormon. There were times where I was watching that and I was like, okay, this is completely against the things that I believe in. So when I find those little moments, I try to latch onto them. Because unfortunately, skimming through the radio or the television or many forms of entertainment, the general perception is that I find a lot less spirituality than I like, um, or a lot less spirituality, a lot of spirituality that I don't agree with, I guess I should say. But that doesn't mean I can't, it's still dependent on the audience. It doesn't mean that I can't try to get something out of it. Why don't I like that? What does that say about my con- constructs as opposed to what they're saying? Uh, th- there's, 
Many of you might have known about the, the, the Sound of Music on last night. The Sound of Music was a live version. Um, there was a very huge amount of people online that liked to um, complain about every scene as it was going on. They would log on and talk about how it wasn't, it wasn't Julie Andrews or whatnot. Um, and although I have a lot of respect for watching it with that lens, my feeling was, well, why? Why wasn't it this way? What can I get out of it, this different thing? And really what I got out of it was there is some kid in America that was just exposed to live theater, finally. I mean, that's great. It doesn't matter if it wasn't the movie, which I love, love the movie. I was heartbroken to find out the movie wasn't the original thing, you know? Mary Martin was heartbroken that she didn't get the role in the movie because they went with a younger model, just like this year when we went with Carrie Underwood for The Sound of Music. It's the same thing. I mean, you know, you guys know. History repeats itself. But I got out of it the joy of finally seeing live theater, and it was actually live. It was not recorded and sent. to me because we watched it last night, but I assumed it was just a, another theater thing that, that had been taken. Yep, yeah. right, yeah. And they're sending out yeah. You mean that was live? It was live. It was live. So the actors actually took a break during the commercials, and I mean, they, they, had, uh, they had an orchestra. They had practiced this in a soundstage for a long time. The leading man, he talked too fast. At, well, he also is, he's not a Native American speaker as well, so okay. he probably was... And he seemed too... He, he, I didn't like it nearly as well as Julianne. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Andrews, I mean, classic, <laughs> classic. <laughs> but it was live, and, and someone saw that finally without having to, I mean, I, I still have students who come to college who've never seen a live production. Um, sure. I was surprised there were so many negative thoughts about it on uh, Facebook <laughs> after it was over last night. I thought it was wonderful. Well, we're in a culture that we're trying to be bonded by negative comments and criticism. That's what bonds us because less and less people are going to church so they don't have that community there. Less and less people are supporting the arts and going to live theater so they don't have that community collective group there. Uh, my college doesn't uh, do a community convocation time anymore. I mean, they do it like three times a year. They don't do it weekly. So we don't have that community time there. So we bond how we can find it. And unfortunately right now it's it's, it's a negative, it's this click of negative, what they call snark. They, they, they talk about posting snark online, and uh, which, you know, snide, snide remarks is where that, that term comes from. Yeah. Other questions about, uh, what about the sound of music either? That's a good one too. I thought it was good to see another cast perform. It's, ni it's always nice to see a different, a different perspective of it. Every time I see a different perspective, I'm always able to say, okay, I would like this from this group, and I'd like to keep this from this group, and I'd like to keep this from this. Yeah. I missed I Have Confidence. That's one of my, I like that song. I have confidence. Yeah. Good. Did you like the new songs that were in it? Well, and those were in the original musical from... 59, and they weren't from the movie version. So having worked on the, the musical, I, I do like those songs. Um, the political song, There's No Way to Stop It, is such a, a double-edged sword, and I, I enjoy having that, that uh, theme in that musical. I, I, en I enjoy those, um, the people that are going back and, and making sure that some of the original work is still seen. Um, it's hard for me when productions will censor uh, South Pacific because of language. Because then we have a tendency to remember South Pacific as it wasn't. You know, oh, that's a good family-friendly musical or, or whatnot. But it, it's, uh, you know, it's laced with racism. And, it, and, it, and some of the language is in there. And if we get rid of that information, then we kind of forget we have this idea that things were different than they actually were, which is dangerous. Some, I think dangerous. I shouldn't say that's kind of a strong word. But yes. How do the 
choices of the plays come out? Do students choose them, or do you choose them? We. Um, that's a really good question. When we have students that are working on a specific, like a senior project, we offer them a list of 10 plays or musicals to read through, and then they submit three to us, and then we pick from that. And a lot of the choice has to come with what we already are doing that year, what we did the year before. Um, we, we're getting ready to do a show right now called Baby with the Bathwater that um, is more in the style of theater of the absurd. It's a, little, um, it's, it's a little disheartening of a show. Theater of the Absurd is a movement that started right after the dropping of the atomic bomb. And the absurdist movement was very much like, wow, if we have the power to just do this, wh what's the point of life? It's not quite existentialism, but it's kind of along that same vein. What's the point of life? I mean, the only thing that we have in common is that we all die, and so let's write these pieces about life and how we should just enjoy it. So we're finally able to do this piece um, because we've done some shows in recent years that have led to that vein. Um, and so, so it kind of depends on the other things that we've done at the time. You may have covered this because I don't hear everything, but do you offer a course in, in um, voice culture? Oh, voice, voice culture. We, no, I mean, we, ha we have a, um, we have specifically a voice class for singers but we don't, for singers, but we don't offer like a enunciation, diction, speaking class, elocution. Uh, we don't do that anymore. I believe it's because the, there's a tendency in our society to um, uh, move away from saying that there is one way to do something. So uh, Shakespeare companies like the Globe in London, they will sometimes say, we want your natural accent for this piece. You know, we will perform Julius Caesar, and if you all have accents from Philadelphia, that's good. Because they want to embrace that, um, they, they want to introduce that theater can happen anywhere. Um, it can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be the Queen's English. It doesn't have to be uh, a certain way. And I, I think I've seen that. That's a great question because I've, I've seen that in church as well. It reflects the people. It reflects the people that it's coming from rather than being passed down from some mountain. On the way, the whole world is now. Do anything you want. Wear your hair anywhere. Wear clothes. Anything you want. No rules. Yeah. <laughs> and for better and for worse. Worse. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, Book of Mormon. What is that? A movie? Or it's a, a musical. A musical. And it's, it's, um, it's a musical about two Mormons who are being sent over to Uganda to do their mission trip. And, and it's, written by, um, uh, it's written by the gentleman that created the cartoon South Park, which is a, a rather crass There's no cartoon. There's chance of us to see it. Well, and I don't want to see it. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the closest it's come, it's come to Denver and possibly Des Moines, but I don't think it's got, oh, Omaha, okay. And I don't know that it's come closer than that yet. It probably will eventually. Um, but it's, it's, it's rather, uh, yeah, I've, I've been in theater, I've been in and around theater for over 30 years, and it's not, it was something that still uh, threw me off and, and shocked me and, and was not as enjoyed, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as uh, people had been talking about it, so I, I'm, yeah, I don't know that it will be, we won't be doing this at McPherson next year, anyway, I should say that. <laughs> I prefer a payoff, I prefer... You have to sit through that. You should have some sort of payoff at the end. Anything else?
Thank you so much for letting me have some time with you today.